Well, good evening, everyone. Always thankful for the opportunities uh, that I have to serve in, in this form. Uh, I work at Pleasance County Middle School, so from my home in uh, Wood County, that's about a half an hour drive and uh, half an hour drive home. So it gives me a little bit of time to do, you know, different <laughs> things. One of the things I like to do is just like to reflect. It's nice to reflect on a period of 30 minutes, reflect on the day and things that are done. But something else I like to do is I, I like to listen to the Bible. I I just uh, put the Bible through my radio speakers and listen to the Bible. Uh, other times I listen to a book. And uh, I just finished a book, and it was called Extreme Ownership. And uh, the author of this book was a Navy SEAL. And I actually got interested in the book because I, I watched a video, a speech he gave. It was 15 minutes. Uh, but the Navy SEAL tells a story. The name is, uh, his name's Jocko. And, and I'd like to start with that story this evening, although I probably won't give it justice at all. But Jocko, this Navy SEAL, he was a commander. He was over a couple different units in Ramadi, Iraq, where he was serving. And he was commanding uh, multiple different units in uh, Ramadi. And it was, it was kind of urban warfare. They would take a street at a time, street after street, clearing the streets, clearing the buildings, working their way to the center of the city. And uh, they were under constant threat of attack from enemy snipers from the buildings that could be hiding anywhere, just very dangerous very dangerous work that he was involved in, and, and he was responsible for all these individuals. Well, one day they were going through Ramadi, and he had a couple units on different sides of the city, and, and he was trying to coordinate as, as best he could, and, and a firefight broke out. And as reports started getting up to him, he started to uh, put pieces together as best he could, but he knew that this firefight was pretty severe. They had one uh, individual that was killed in action, he was actually an Iraqi soldier because some of the local Iraqis had teamed up with the U.S. military at the time. So one Iraqi soldier was dead, three other Iraqi soldiers were wounded, and that's what he knew at the time. After the smoke cleared, it realized that uh, that day they weren't fighting the enemy, they were actually fighting themselves. It was friendly fire. They had actually engaged one another. Some of the uh, Iraqis had broke off from the main unit and they assaulted a building which some United States military was in and uh, one of the individuals there got hurt. Uh, so four wounded, one dead, friendly fire, not an enemy in sight that day. Well, reports go through to him and then uh, he gets a call from Washington that they're going to come and, and have an investigation on the matter. And he says investigations aren't good. He said usually people uh, get fired and uh, you know things are are taken very seriously when those investigations happen. So he, he was, he was the, given the job to give a report of the day and all the things that, that happened. And he started creating this report, and he started going through and, and uh, highlighting all the mistakes and the individuals that made mistakes on that day that led to the friendly fire incident. And he said, this person didn't communicate here, this person didn't communicate here. But before he presented that report to the people that were going to be investigating the issue, he realized that something was missing in the report. And he felt that the part that was missing in the report was his responsibility. He called all the troops in, and, and the investigators were there that day, and he was about to give his presentation. And he looked out at, at the individuals that were involved, and he said, whose fault was it? What happened? You know, however long ago it was. And, and actually, people started volunteering all across the room. You know, the United States uh, soldiers in the house, they said, well, we should have sent communication up the line of command that we had switched buildings. Uh, the other commander said, I should have kept track of the Iraqi unit that I was over charge of. And, and, they, and all these people basically, and he kept saying, no, it wasn't your fault. No, it wasn't your fault. No, it wasn't your fault. And eventually, after they basically admitted to all the mistakes that he had recorded in the report, he said, you know, really, he said, it's my fault. He says, I'm the commander. You were all under me. It was my fault that this happened. Actually, no one ended up losing their job, but he went on to write a book called Extreme Ownership, and that's what he attributes to him keeping his job was he says, I took extreme ownership of the situation. It was my fault that the troops were in that situation that day. It was my fault that the Iraqi soldier died. It was my fault that a U.S. Uh, individual was injured and that three other Iraqis, he said, it was, it was all my fault. Extreme responsibility, extreme ownership. You know, I try to look at through everything like a, through a Christian lens, and when I look through a Christian lens at that situation, 
you know, when I look at responsibility in general, that's something that I think God is really after us in our lives. He wants us to be responsible for our lives and things around us. The definition of responsibility is the state or fact of having a duty to deal with something. You know, throughout your life, you have a duty to deal with some things. It's your responsibility. It's your obligation. If there's one thing that could definitely help us going into this new year, 2019, it would be if we were more responsible. More responsible for the individuals that we touch. More responsible with the way we conduct ourselves. Responsible in every aspect of our lives. I think the Bible teaches that. And I think the great irony is, is that if we don't take responsibility on this plane of life, we're going to realize that we should have taken responsibility a long time ago. We should have taken responsibility way back when we had a chance and we had a say in what decisions we were going to make in our life. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 12, it says, So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. And I think that's what we find in Luke chapter 19 is we have this individual who's leaving. He gives these individuals some things. He wants them to trade. And when he returns, what is he asking them of? He's asking them to give an account. Account of what? What they were responsible for. You know, when God comes back, whenever we're at Judgment Day, you know, there's going to be extreme responsibility. There's going to be extreme ownership that you're going to have to take. You're going to have to stand there on Judgment Day before God, and you're going to have to give an account of the things that you were responsible for. There's so many things that we're responsible for throughout this life, but I just want to focus on three this evening. Three things that you're going to be responsible for, because I think our society, at least it seems like many times as we look, we live in a society that's constantly trying to pass the responsibility. They're trying to pass the responsibility when it comes to schools, pass the responsibilities when it comes to church, pass responsibilities away when it comes to their job. It seems like, unfortunately, everybody's first instinct is to blame others, but never looking at ourselves. Let's look at ourselves this evening. What are some things that you are going to be responsible for in 2019? Not only 2019, but your entire life up to this point and your entire life going forward. Number one thing you're going to be responsible for is what you say. Is what you say. You're going to be responsible on the day of judgment for things that you say. In fact, the Bible gives us all kinds of warnings trying to give this idea into our heads that you're going to be responsible for the things that you say. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37, it says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. You know, words are such an interesting thing. Our language, our speech is such an interesting thing, because it's something that we do every day. And you're going to be accountable for that. All the words that we have uttered, we're going to be accountable for. And certainly that's something that, if we think about and we reflect on it, we meditate on it, is really a sobering thought. We're going to be accountable for all the words that we have said in public, and in private. We're going to be accountable for all words. You know, this is something I reflect on and think on many times being a preacher, but also a teacher. My words have a huge impact. In fact, when, when, when I went to teaching school to become a teacher, one of the things they said is if you teach someone wrong the first time, it takes three times teaching it correctly to kind of undo that. Of course, they've done all kinds of research on it, and they've tried to figure out different things, so on and so forth. But if you teach a student wrong the first time, it takes three times to undo it. Certainly, we're accountable for our words. We're accountable for the way that we communicate with others. And the Bible warns us, you are going to be accountable for the way you communicate, the way you talk to individuals throughout this life. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, it says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification that may impart grace to the hearers. In Matthew chapter 15 and verse 11 it says, Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. You know, I reflect on the words in Matthew chapter 15. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. See, you got to think, where do our words first originate? They first originate in our mind. And sometimes they stay in our mind, and sometimes we, we keep them in our mind, and sometimes we meditate on those things in our mind, and those things will eventually come out. What are the things that you're thinking on? What are the things you're focused on? What are the things that come out of your mouth? Are you really considering those things? 
think it's one of the most challenging things we have, one of the things that we're responsible for is our tongues. Trying to make sure that our language is in check, make sure we're saying the right things, saying the correct things. You know, being a teacher, sometimes I've, I've encountered this situation where I talked to a student about something that they said to another student that maybe, maybe harmed another student in some way, or, 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 you know, they could be under a lot of different cases. But sometimes I'll confront a student on something that they said, and you know what they'll say? Oh, I didn't say that. I, wait, I just heard you say that. But, you know, really think about what you just said to this other, and, and a little later they'll say, well, yeah, I said that, but I didn't really mean it. Are we really considering our language as we go throughout this life? Are we thinking about the way we're communicating with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ as we move throughout this life? Certainly we're all going to make mistakes. That's not what the Bible... But are we mindful of our language and our communication with one another? I didn't say that. And then they revert back and they say, well, I didn't really mean it. That's not what I really meant. Uh, okay, I meant I actually did say that, but that's not what I really meant. Are we like that sometimes? We're speaking so quickly that we don't consider our words and the effect on those that are around us. See, the great thing is, is God really does know our hearts. He can really look in and, and, and see our motives and so on and so forth. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4, it says, Let it not even be named among you, as it is fitting for the saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor coarse gesturing, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. It says, Neither filthiness nor foolish talking. There's probably a lot of things that can fall underneath that category. Filthiness nor foolish talking. We have a task that's set before us, and certainly it's a hard task, but it's one you're going to be accountable for. It's one that I'm going to be accountable for when, before we, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and it's that you're responsible for your tongue. You're responsible for the things that you say to other individuals. In fact, the Bible gives us warning after warning after warning. The psalmist said, uh, Psalm 141 and verse 3, it said, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Is there a guard over your mouth? Certainly we want to speak the truth, and we're not talking about censoring ourselves in a bad way, but we're talking about censoring ourselves in a righteous way, that not only do we conform our language, but how do we conform our language is by our thoughts. What are you thinking about? In Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 23, it says, Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Are you guarding your mouth, are you guarding your tongue? Is it something that you take seriously or say, I'm not responsible for that? Do you make all kinds of excuses for the things that you say to individuals? Well, they said this to me, so now I can say this to them. Do you make all kinds of excuses? Well, they said this to me, they did this to me. I think this is what they meant about me. And that gives you license to say whatever you want. Are you responsible for your tongue and the way that you speak and the things that you say? I think the Bible sends us a very clear message. Certainly, we have a long way to go when it comes to being responsible for our tongue and our speech. And the way I try to encourage myself, because I know I've fallen short many times in relation to the speech and the things that I've said throughout my life, is the road to our best self is always under construction. The road to our best self is always under construction. We can never look at ourselves and say, you know, I've really perfected my language. I'm at the point where I need to be. I think we're always on that road of constant construction, trying to make ourselves better each and every day, to guard our tongues better each and every day, to make sure that we're living our lives the way God wants us to live. You are certainly going to be responsible for the things that you say this coming year and throughout your life. James chapter 1, verse 26, it says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. You think you're religious, but you don't bridle your tongue? No, 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 that doesn't work. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Are you responsible for the things you say? Certainly you are. Will you take responsibility for your tongue? It seems such like a small thing. You know, when we think of the in perspective of our whole body, the tongue is such a small thing, but yet how powerful and strong it can be and how it can affect other people in our lives if we don't guard it and we don't consider it and we don't think about it. Perhaps that's why the Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, Slow to speak, slow to wrath. 
Perhaps that's why the Bible gives us those words of wisdom. Because we will be responsible for those things that we say. So if we're going to be speaking, perhaps we should be slow to speak. I think we've all been in the situation at some point in our lives where we said something and immediately after we realized that that was wrong. I've been there many times. We have made the mistake. We didn't guard our tongue. We didn't guard what we, we were thinking. We didn't guard what came out of our mouth. And what happened is, is as soon as it comes out of our mouth, we go, that was wrong. I can't believe I said that. Will you be responsible for what you say in 2019? Will you be mindful of your words and the way you conduct yourself throughout this coming year? You know, something else you're going to be responsible for is you're going to be responsible for the things that you do in 2019. You know, this seems so simple and obvious. Well, yeah, obviously, I'm going to be responsible for the things that I do. But what I find interesting is the things that are most visible sometimes are the things that we forget most about. Sarah's there every day for me. You know, sometimes it's easy to take those things for granted. Those things that you see each and every day. But do you understand the things that you do every day, the things that people do around you, you're going to be accountable for those. It's amazing the things that are visible in our lives, but it's amazing how people try to dodge those things. I'm, oh, I'm, not, responsibility, I'm not responsible for that action that I did. I'm not responsible for that action I did. We're going to be responsible for our actions. Both good and bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10 says, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Yeah, you're going to be responsible for the things that you've done throughout this life, the things that you do throughout this life, whether good or evil. Do you reflect on that? Do you think about that? That you're going to be responsible for your actions? What if you had to answer to God about your actions? I mean, that's what we basically just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, is that you're going to answer to God for your actions. Would you be willing to stand before God today and justify to Him your actions today, yesterday, and the next day? Well, that's what you're going to do. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to give an answer for the actions that you've committed throughout this life. The reality is, is you are going to answer to God. You are going to be responsible for those things that you've done upon this plane of life. In James chapter 2, verse 24, it says, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. What's that works talking about? The things that we do throughout this life. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, it says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do the things which I say? Certainly we're going to be accountable. Romans chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. The doers of the law will be justified. In John chapter 13 and verse 17, it says, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Certainly we'll be accountable for the things that we do throughout this life. But sometimes people try to shade away from their personal responsibility. People will try to shade away from their obligations. They'll try to shade away from their responsibilities, both spiritually but also in their physical lives. You know, one time my brother, of course this has probably happened about every teacher who's ever taught, but I remember one time my older brother, he actually teaches with me at Pleasants County. He teaches 8th grade social studies. And we run a club on Fridays. It's, it's knockout club. So it's like basketball club. So we have two knockouts. He watches one side. I watch the other. Well, one of the kids went up to this other student and shoved him. And he was just kind of being playful sometimes. But, you know, you got you to gotta reel that stuff in. Otherwise, it gets out of hand. So my brother says, you know, to that student, come over here. And he says, why did you shove that other student? And he said, I didn't shove the other student. And he said, I just saw you shove the other student. You know, it's interesting how people try to get out of things, you know. We, he saw you do it. But yet you're going to say, no, no, I didn't do it. I didn't shove anyone. No, 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 I didn't do that thing. And I wonder if that's what people are going to try to do on judgment. They're going to try to pull something like that on God. God's going to be like, I saw you do it. I saw everything that you did, the good and the bad, the private and the public, and the, everything in the shadows, everything in the light. I saw everything. You're going to be responsible for those things that you do throughout this life. He denied it for about two minutes straight. 
But see, my brother, he wouldn't give up on it because he saw him do it. He said, no, no, I didn't do it. No, no, I didn't do it. And then finally he admitted to touching him. You know, well, I guess I might have touched him a little bit. And then he goes on for about another minute, and then he finally says, yeah, I guess I did shove him. I guess based off of your definition of shoving, I guess I shoved him. I mean, he was trying to weasel out of the sand any way he could. You know, and I wonder sometimes, where, where do our kids learn that? Yeah, it could be from the parents. You know, sometimes I wonder about me as a teacher, you know. Am I being a good example for these students? Is there any time as a teacher that I try to weasel my way out of responsibility and I'm setting up that example for that student? Do we understand that we're going to have to be responsible for those things that we do and that God sees all things? You know, I think it's better to take on or understand the principle in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, it says, He who covers his sins will not prosper. If you try to hide your sins, you're not going to prosper. What's the next part of the verse? It says, But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You know, I think we kind of see that from the Navy SEAL. He confessed his mistakes. He said, Hey, I I messed up. I was the commander. I made a mistake. And you know what? He wasn't fired. He wasn't, you know. And I'm not saying that if he was fired uh, that it wouldn't be justified. But you know what? When people take responsibility, it gives you a little bit of more admiration for him. And that's actually what he says that he found, is that when he took responsibility for his actions, not only did he receive more uh, respect from his commanding officers, but also his troops. Because they're like, this guy's willing to you know, kind of take the hit for me. Even though I know I made a mistake, I should have communicated up the chain where my troops were, and I should have did this. And, and they realized they made mistakes. Well, you take responsibility throughout your life. Will you confess your mistakes and move on? Or will you hang on to your pride and say, no, I'm flawless, I'm perfect, I've never made a mistake? Or will you say, I've made a mistake, I need to move on, I need to correct things and make them better? Seems like the only place responsibility is in our culture is when it comes to drinking, which is a joke, you know. They have the commercial, da 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 please be responsible when you drink, which is ridiculous. You can't be responsible and drink. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't work that way. Sorry. It doesn't work that way. If you're doing that, you're not going to be responsible, and and people are going to be hurt, yourself included. But it seems like responsibility is thrown into these odd categories where it's like, that's not even being responsible. It's like responsibility is being downgraded where people can't stand up and say, yes, I did that. That was a mistake. That was wrong. No one can make a mistake anymore. Everybody's right. We're going to be accountable in this life for the things that we do. You know, I think back to when I was in college, you know, I was responsible sometimes to uh, read the textbook. Some students aren't necessarily the best at that sometimes. They'll say, oh, I'll read the textbook. I'll put that off, put that off. You're responsible to read the textbook if that's what your instructor says. You're responsible for that, you know. What are we responsible for as Christians? You know, we're, we're going to be responsible for the opportunities that we had to assemble with the saints, and we chose not to. Not because of illness, not because of weather, not because of those, those things on the outside, but because we made a choice. You're going to be accountable for those things that you do. You're going to be accountable for every page that you read in the Bible. Have you thought about that? You're going to be responsible. You're going to be accountable for every page that you read in the Bible. Are you reading your Bible? Are you considering the words of Jesus, the things that he has laid forth? Number one, you're going to be responsible for the things that you say. Number two, you're going to be responsible for the things you do. And number three is you are going to be responsible, and this is one that really is sobering when I think think about it, is you're going to be responsible for the things that you think. You know, sometimes people think, you know, I'm safe in here. You know, I'm safe in here. I can have bad thoughts in here. I can have sinful thoughts in here, you know, but it's in here. It doesn't manifest itself in the physical. I'll be okay. Actually, God's after your mind. That's really what he's after. Because he's, if he's after your mind and he gets your mind and your heart, he's got your speech. If your mind is right, you're not going to have problems with your speech. You know, if your mind's right, you're not going to have any problems with your manifestation of actions in the physical plane of life. But God's after your mind. You're going to be responsible for your thoughts. In Romans chapter two, uh, 12 and verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God's after your mind. He wants your mind to be renewed. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what it is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's clear that the Bible is after our mindset. The Bible is after our thoughts. And not in a bad way. 
Because God knows if you're thinking right, you're going to speak right. God knows if you're thinking right, you're going to act right. Are you thinking right? There's an interesting transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You know, we have the Ten Commandments laid out, you know, don't commit adultery, you know, keep the Sabbath holy, all these. But what you find is a lot of the Ten Commandments are in relation to the physical manifestation of, you know, uh, thoughts, you know. I'll give you a good example, adultery. In the Old Testament, Ten Commandments says don't commit adultery. New Testament, what does the Bible talk about? It actually talks about the step before adultery. Well, where, where can we find that? Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, chapter, uh, verse 27, 28, says, You have heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery <coughs> with her in his heart. See, once we transition to the New Testament, it's like Jesus is really focusing on the mind. Not that God wasn't after the mind before, but God knows if you don't think adulterous thoughts, you're not going to commit adultery. You know what it says in the Old Testament? It says, do not murder. What does it say in the New Testament? It says, don't hate your neighbor. You know, it's hard to murder someone, I think, at least intentionally, you know, if you're not hating, if you don't have those hateful thoughts. See, God's after our mind. He's after our thoughts because if he gets our mind right, He's not going to have to worry about our speech. He's not going to have to worry about our actions because we are going to be in tune with God. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on evil and the good. Does that include your mind? The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Are the Lord, are Lord's eyes able to see your mind? Able to see your thoughts? Certainly the Bible is after, Jesus is after our mindset, our thinking. Studying God's word and letting it impact our hearts and our minds that in turn affects our, what we talk, the way we talk, and the way we act. Colossians chapter, two, uh, Colossians chapter 3, rather, verses 2 through 15, it talks about the new man. But one of the th verses in that passage, it says in verse 2, it says, Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. It's talking about the new man, but it says, Set your mind on things above and not on things of this earth. If you shift your mind the right direction, you don't have to worry about what you say, and you don't have to worry about what you do. Not in the sense, because your mind is right. If your mind is right, everything else is going to take care of itself. If you can fix your mind problem, if you can think, uh, fix your thoughts, your life is going to go in the right direction in relation to God. Bible, Jesus is after your mind and your thoughts. And some people might not like that idea. But you're talking about extreme responsibility. The Bible tells you to be responsible for your thoughts. You're going to be accountable for your thoughts. And when it comes to judgment day... God is going to see all of that. You're not going to be able to hide behind the veil. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible kind of gives us a picture of these things that we should be meditating on, thinking on. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What is your mind focused on? When I think about Judgment Day, that is certainly extreme responsibility. There's going to be no weaseling out, trying to get around it this way, that way. But how do you handle your life? Do you handle your life with the attitude that I am responsible for my life? Or do you find yourself blaming everything on everybody else? Well, why did you say that? Well... You know what? The teacher said this to me, and then this person said this to me, and this person said this to me, and that's why I said that, and that was probably inappropriate. Well, this person did this to me, and this person said this to me, and then they did this to me, and that's why I did that. I don't think that's going to fly on Judgment Day. Will you be responsible for what you say? Will you be responsible for what you do? And will you even be responsible for what you think? Because the great irony is, if you're not going to be responsible here on the plane of life, God is certainly going to call us all out on that day. And he's going to say, you should have been responsible for what you said. You should have been responsible for what you did. You should have been responsible for what you thought.
throughout this life. You know, becoming a Christian takes a lot of responsibility. Becoming a Christian takes a lot of responsibility because you have to admit, I've made some mistakes. I've sinned. And it wasn't because of what they said. It's not because of what these people did. It's not because of this, that, or the other. It was because of me. I am the reason that I have sinned. I am the reason that I have made these mistakes. And I am the reason that I need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That I need the forgiveness of sins. Becoming a Christian takes a lot of responsibility because you have to say, yes, I made a mistake. And now I want to make it right the only way I can with the help of Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're subject to the Lord's invitation. You need to become a New Testament Christian. Perhaps you've walked off the straight and narrow path. You need to come back. You need to take responsibility. But it's not only today. It's throughout our lives. It's the quest laid before the Christian to be responsible in every aspect that we can. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we ask you to please come as we stand and as we sing.